Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, welcome back to our series of lecture. I am really delighted to introduce our guest today, uh, Sandy Idiot. She is an architect, artist, and educator. She has development research and project based on artistic process, engaging in struggle for justice and equality. She is current uh, the co-director and uh, of the an architecture and art uh, collective name the Colonies uh, um, Architecture Art Research. She is co-founded uh, in uh, 2007 with uh, San Alessandro Petti uh, in in Palestine. Her is visiting professor uh, and at Lund University in the Department of Architecture and Building Environment. In 2012, uh, with Alessandro Petti, she founded the campus in Camps and the uh, experimental uh, education program uh, in the refuge camp in, uh, in Bethlehem. And uh, she weeks ago, uh, Sandy and Alessandro Petti has been awarded the, with the, the Golden Lion for best participation at the last Venice Biennale. Uh, for the for the low standing committed to the deep uh, political engagement with architectural and learning practice of the colonization in Palestine and Europe. And I also want to thank uh, Professor Camillo Boano for being uh, with us today and uh, moderated the discussion. So I will uh, leave the floor to, to Sandy online. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. I'm really happy to um, be actually part of an Italian university. It has been quite a while. Indeed, we are were, uh, we studied in Italy. I studied in Venice, met Alessandro in Venice, and um, indeed uh, then decided to, and did our first exhibition in Venice Biennale in 2003, which is 20 years uh, already ago. And after doing a stateless nation in Venice Biennale, and it was really about uh, what happens with undocumented people uh, when we deal with representations, nation state representations such as Venice Biennale. And, and the answer to it, it was uh, to represent a Palestinian pavilion. And we decided to actually represent um, huge, uh, travel documents and different passports that Palestinians carries and question, and it was not only Palestinians in that sense, but many other uh, people, how and who is representing uh, these people? Do they have the right to represent themselves and in which way? And in, indeed has been um, since then, the, uh, the question was what would be, what is happening in between uh, these nation states. But in from 2003 to 2006, we were still be working between Palestine and Europe, but still have had this feeling that all, all what we were doing in, in these years was to talk to the West and to just explain the injustice that is happening in, in the rest of the world. And and somehow we felt that there was a bit of a roof uh, over our uh, heads and, and we were in, in working within a very limited uh, frame. And at that point, um, actually, I got pregnant and um, we wanted, we were thinking where to raise our uh, daughter at that point. And we were not very keen in raising our daughters within a very modern idea of a family, me and Alessandro and only us. So we decided for many reasons, both work reason where we felt the roof is on our head and personal family reasons to come and, and have our daughter raised within an extended family, within a place where and somehow uh, there is different kind of support uh, system that, that were uh, going on. And Indeed, you know, I'm telling you this story because it is at the heart of our practice. We don't, we are not, uh, you know, they teach you always to be objective when you practice, to be distanced, to keep yourself away and just, uh, uh, you know, try to be, yeah, I would say objective. Our practice is exactly the opposite. Our practice has been always since ever answering 
certain issues that are dealing with us because we were convinced that if we were not able to answer this for ourselves, then there is no way that we can answer it for anyone else, right? So, and somehow I think it's it's a complete different way of operating. No, we didn't consider ourselves the researchers, the architects that have to look at the world and give their perspective and, and frame, but we were just uh, in somehow trying to figure out certain issues that, that felt to us urgent in that particular moment of our uh, practice. And this is since the first moment we established DAR, we co-founded DAR, this was the main uh, drive. You know? So when people ask us how you decide for your projects, what are your methodology of working? I think it's it's way more, I rather than speaking about methodologies, I would say it is using our special knowledge because space is extremely important in understanding our realities. It is a little bit um, using our special knowledge to figure out certain urgencies that we were living in that particular moment. And indeed, you know, in 2006, 2007, we, we were in uh, Palestine and in somehow maybe our center shifted and it was not any more convincing the West of what's happening in Palestine, hoping that this would change the realities in places in uh, places outside of Europe, like Palestine and many other places. But rather than the question shifted into what does it mean to decolonize being architects in Palestine in 2007, right? So, and in, in somehow I think it's our... We, uh, only by our bodies moving somewhere else, our center shifted and, and the urgency shifted. And it was about how do we live today? How do we understand uh, uh, living in that moment under decolonization? And what is our role as architects, right? How can we contribute as architects in struggles of decolonization? And at that point, uh, and somehow we uh, established Dar with Yal Weizmann. And Dar actually means in Arabic home. Uh, indeed, it's in English decolonizing architecture, art and residency, but in Arabic means home. And it was a moment where we felt that even in a place like Palestine 20 years ago, speaking about decolonization, thinking about decolonization was not really common. You know, it, it was still at its extreme beginning. And we felt that we lack references, that there are no institutional sort of framework, references, academic references that would permit us to understand as architects today, what is our role under colonialism under uh, Israeli occupation? How can we act in, in that sense? And we simply made a very, uh, it, it felt at that point the only way that we had. We opened up our home and we were living in a very tiny apartment with a big terrace in front of it. And we turned up the house and the living room and our terrace into a place where we were actually inviting people to do lectures. We were having a lot of collective thinking and a lot of conversation. And, and then at a certain point, we even decided to open up a residency. And, you know, without, in, in only a few years, uh, our, our home in Palestine, I mean, because we decided to open it up in this way and to raise it a collective home, it became a point of reference for many actually architects, researchers, artists, um, and, and, and academics that were interested in dealing with topics such as decolonization in that moment. And, and you know, it was, it was incredibly uh, uh, interesting for us because in somehow we created the frame. Our house was the frame. Our living room was the frame. We were sitting around food, talking and thinking and, and imagining how uh, how the future might look like. And, you know, I do not want to spend a lot of time on the Palestinian chapter because I would also like to have time to spend it a little bit on the Europe chapter. But matter of fact, we spend uh, many years in, in Palestine understanding what does it uh, mean for us to decolonize. And I want to bring you to one major thing, you know, because we were... Um, 
you know, when we studied architecture in Venice, we were taught at that time that, you know, operating in the public is, is way uh, more maybe ethical, maybe makes more sense, maybe make out of us a, a way better architects. And, you know, when we built a hospital, when we built a library, when we built a museum, we felt that we are building something absolutely uh, important for the public, while when we were building or thinking about our grandparents' house or even about our house, it felt like a bit of a reduction of our role as architects. And it felt always that, you know, intervening in the public is the right way to do. While when we returned back to Palestine, our first, first uh, uh, projects were around the idea of turning and is thinking about an Israeli settlement that is in Palestinian occupied territories, which means that they are illegally built by Israeli by, by Israeli colonialism. They were built by Palestinian workers. So in some way, we feel that as 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 a collective, we had absolutely the right to think how this would come back to Palestinians and. The first thing that we began to figure out is, is the map, right? And, and in which way, what were the legal tools that Israelis managed to expropriate Palestinian lands? And this was maybe our first uh, sort of realization, is that during the Ottoman period, there was so many categories that were actually lay between the private and the public. And one of these categories is, is called the Masha. And the Masha is a collective rural land that is not owned by people, but as when they activated, when they plant this land, it becomes theirs while they are activating it. And we immediately, immediately realize that there is a huge difference between the masha and the public, because the public can exist without people activating it. Since about, think about an empty plaza that represents certain kinds of power or many other things, you know, I mean, public can absolutely exist because there is a public that is managing it, right? There is a state, there is a public that is managing it. Well, the masha has stopped to exist the moment that people stop to use it and to, to practice it and to activate it. So when the Israeli uh, colonialism arrived to Palestine, what did they do is that they got all these categories of of commons and collectives that are standing between the private and the public, they map them as we are good in doing in our faculties of architecture when we have to draw maps and say, this is public, this is private. And because we are in a very modern society that is divided only between public and private, what happens is that Israelis map all what Palestinian had in common as public. Public is the state, the state is Israel, and therefore, what happened that the Palestinian, what Palestinian had in collective, what Palestinians were collectively uh, using, was expropriated by the public. And this is an extremely important realization for us, because at that moment, we began to suspect the public and to say, is it really about public and private? Or it is about how do we use public? And how do we use private? I mean, our house was turned in only a few months and with not big efforts into a, an, in, an institute for decolonization in Palestine. While what Palestinian had in common was turned in, in, through legal processes into a public and was expropriated by a colonial regime. So for, we, we began to not, not to buy anymore this whole that, that the public is good and the private is bad, the private is about neoliberalism and this and that. It's Tell me, how do you use these categories for me to, to tell you if it makes sense or not? So at that point, it was a bit of a radical shifting for us because we began to understand that maybe our role as architects is to understand how can we create today mashas or or maybe the, the the nearest to it is common how can we common how how commoning can exist as a verb but extremely important 
that is not, you know, the attempts always when we speak about commons is how do we turn public spaces into common? How do we turn public spaces into be used by people and as, as a common? Well, we are also extremely interested in understanding also how can we turn the private into a common? How can we, commoning the private becomes an extremely very important fact for us because in some way even in 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 different dimensions you know the private is really taking us you now we speak about climate change we speak about many things where the private space plays an extremely important role but we tend not to talk about it because it's it's mainly private so in somehow we became extremely interested in understanding how struggles a lot of time, and especially when governments are not aligned with people, the only place that becomes available to struggle are private places. And how not to dismiss that? What, what does that mean? How can we understand that as a major part of uh, uh, people's transformations and struggles? And indeed, you know, I myself, I'm, I, I was um, in Palestine during the first intifada, where uh, schools and universities were completely shut down by the Israeli uh, occupation. And in in few days, our parents, grandparents turned our living rooms and any empty garage in the neighborhood into a school we were we, where we were studying in a hidden ways, you know, not, not seen by uh by the israeli occupation so in some way and and this is not only palestinians each time that a regime or a government was not aligned with the people people felt that the public does not belong to them the private sphere became an extremely important sphere to struggle with and and here i will come a bit more maybe into um Moving back to Europe, right, and and in that sense, also very importantly, the role of the living room in in uh, in that sense, in in a place where the where there is a lot of pride around the public space, right. I mean, especially European Western culture, the public space, the the being in public has been always an 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 a pride of of that uh, society. And, uh, you know, after spending 10 years in Palestine, and in that sense, we never managed to get for Alessandro any family reunion um, paper. So it was only each three months had to go out of the country. We were, he was on, um, on a touristic visa. So that made our being in Palestine temporary. And we even, we, we spent 10 years almost being permanent temporariness. Uh, People and in some way also working in refugee camps, we realized that being permanently in a temporary uh, uh, condition is, is a condition that is not only belonging to refugees. I mean, Palestinian refugees spent 70 years in refugee camps. They are still insisting and talking about their right of return, yet they are actually involved every day in that temporariness, building that temporariness. And there are a lot of people, I mean, I'm sure that many of you are all, also sitting in this, uh, in this room is questioning, should I buy a sofa? Or maybe I am leaving in six months, so it's better I leave, I still where I am and, and not improve my life. And you end up by staying in the same place for five, six, seven, eight years, thinking that you are leaving the day after. And we are living more and more in a world where temporariness becomes a, a major condition of many, many people. Yet as architects, we are only trained how to operate within a permanent situation you know we are still within the same mentality that if we will build a church a museum or a hospital that would become permanent and would last way more than us and this is the aim of each one of us yet I have a feeling that you know architecture did not spend enough time to think temporariness beyond only uh, you know, the smart tent, the smart shelter and working with the UN in that. But we did, we are not considering temporariness as a condition, permanent temporariness as a new condition we are living in. And what does that mean? I mean, can we only have one 
shaped public space, or it should be different because we are living more now in a temporary society and not everybody could be included in the same sort of public space, right? So I think that we realize more and more living 10, year, 10 years in a temporary situation in Palestine that, you know, permanency is not uh, the only way. There are a lot of people and it's not only about being refugees again and, and it might actually go even cross class, that there are many people that are not anymore born and die in the same place, right? And that they they have different places that they want to call home. They have different places that they belong to. Yet the order of the world where we are living in today is, is obliging us to be loyal to one only home. I mean, this is, this is how they constantly, you know, when, whenever we uh are we have to represent ourselves there is always this, the palestinian architect the italian architect the palestinian practice etc cetera, etc cetera. there is i mean for me there is many places i i can call home now there are many languages that are my sort of uh uh home too yet it seems that each time i have to speak in the public i have to choose one home and i have to be part of that one frame so people will 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 have it easy or institutions would have it easy to represent us right so and somehow and here i want to move uh quite quickly to our move in europe so when after 10 years we had no other option but to move in europe and i have to say i was in a complete total crisis i was not happy to come back after maybe living 13 years in italy that you know i have to admit were ex extremely uh good ones yet i think that um i was a bit in the front of a dilemma because because when i arrived to italy you know both as students but after that working there i sort of decided to um accept the challenge of integration i would put it this way i mean i want to begin now to problematize integration as as an architect but i want to problematize it for us to understand better what kind of public space we can live in. And for me, you know, I if 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 I will be one of these people that would be evaluated on their efforts of integration in Italy, I would say that I would be one of these amazing examples that I would tick all the boxes. Because in somehow I may I did my PhD in, in Italian. So I speak and write. Italian perfectly. I was asked to speak English because many of you doesn't speak Italian, but normally I, I can actually have a lecture in Italian. I love to cook Italian food. I miss Italy way more than Alessandro miss it. I am the one in the family pushing always for us to go to Italy. We have two half Italian daughters. Yet when I am even now, you know, winning a, 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 a a golden lion, you know, I'm I'm always represented as the Palestinian, right? So for how much you will be doing and ticking all these boxes, I end up almost always by being described in Italy as the Italian wife, right? And or as the Palestinian uh, architect to the max, right? So and somehow I, I was thinking that, you know, you can do this at a certain age and and do that race towards integration. But but I can tell you, you know, if someone like me cannot feel that this frame fits fits in somehow, you know, I'm always I, I did not become Italian in, in that sense. It's it's there is a very specific framework, and I would even claim fascist flame framework that would describe who is Italian, who is not Italian, that we are still living up to this moment in Italy. So and somehow I thought how I would come back to Europe without having to go into this race of integration again, because also we were going to Sweden. And I thought if someone like me failed in Italy, where I can very easily pass by being Italian, what chances do I have in Sweden? So I, I completely arrived to Sweden and think, how can I exist in somehow with, with dignity? How can I be someone that actually would uh, be able to practice, shift the frame the way we used to do in Palestine? Because I still wanted to challenge the frame. I still wanted to have 
a practice like dar in Europe. But in some way, arriving there, I realized what are my options, right? What what are the possibilities I can I can have in order to uh, so I I began also to problematize very much. Uh, the integration uh, policies and and ways of of speaking, even in academia, you know, always this whole we should include everybody, but who is including whom, right? I mean, now in the universities, where when I hear someone telling me we want to include you, I am I got so irritated because in some way there is a power of including. There are always that frame where people have feel the right to include others, and others will be waiting to be included. And I got immediately stuck in uh, in this i i have to say and began to question what are my options and return back maybe hospitality at that point uh was a crucial if if in palestine our our um our urgency was how to understand what does it mean to live under colonialism and still be practicing decolonization as architects. And we did so many projects that you can go and, and see. I mean, I, I think it's important that at the end, um, you know, it's 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 always possible to react to what, what we are in front. So if in Palestine, we feel that there is a lot of knowledge that needs to be uh, produced, we uh establish a university in a refugee camp we uh designed a concrete tent to speak about that permanent temporariness we open up our house and turn it into residencies we thought how can we transform israeli settlements against itself how can we analyze colonial architecture and turn it against itself and the thing is that in Palestine, that it was quite clear that we have a colonial physical occupation that, that as architects, we can understand specially and try to react to. to. When we arrived to Europe, it was a bit unclear what would be our role, right, in Europe. Are we returning back to the center? And, and what does that mean for us? And we just, you know, coming back with our buddies here, we realized that Maybe this is another, if in Palestine we began to suspect the public, in coming back to Europe, we began to suspect the role of modern architecture in our society. And then I will try to explain why. I mean, when, when, col when colonization went all over the place to colonize people, the promise was not we are coming to colonize you, steal your land, expropriate all what you have in common, et cetera, et cetera. No, the promise was we are coming to modernize you. We are coming to civilize you. We are coming to bring modern architecture and, you know, colonial fascist architecture always was accompanied by great architects because in somehow architecture played a major role in facilitating colonization in the rest of the world. And colonization would not have worked in the same way if it was not in marriage with modern architecture, because this was the promise. We come, we modernize you. So the question here was, what, what can we do in Europe? You know, how can we demodernize? But demodernize is not, we don't see this as no electricity or no trains or whatsoever. But what are really modern practicing of existing today in Europe that we can challenge. And one of this is this whole separation between the private and the public to begin with. This whole framing, everybody zoning, you know, we are zoning constantly. We want to understand everything. We want to have the single building. We want to have the separation between that and, and, and this. We, we want to have the separation between disciplines, but then we would like to have multidisciplinary uh, uh, things. But still, each discipline has his own sort of way. And we realized immediately that, that our struggle of decolonization in Europe is to trace back all what modernity as life practice put in, in, in practice and understand how can we challenge 
this kind of practicing, what hospitality means, what neighborhood means, what is the difference between guest and host uh, means in that sense. But in, in, in order to sort of uh, reach you to where I want to go, you know, when we arrive here and realize that the demodern, instead of thinking decoloniality, because in some way, you know, when you speak about decolonization, decoloniality in Europe, it's very easy that people dismiss it as not of, this is not my problem. You know, it's you have to go to Palestine to decolonize. You have to go to Africa to, to decolonize. You have to go somewhere else. This is not, so, you know, this is something that has been. Many people actually also claim that colonization is over, et cetera, et cetera. But when you touch modern architecture, then people got a little bit alerted. It's like, what do you mean? What does that mean? But in some way, there are a lot of traces. And I think that we felt that if we don't deal with that marriage between modernity and colonization, there is no way to decolonize in Europe and, and make people understand that, you know, be, the modernity today is a major important architecture practice, space practice to understand when it happens that we separated completely the public from the private and we alienated any kind of overlapping between both. Where are commons? How can we create commons coming from private and coming from the public? And at that point, I think arriving to Sweden, I come back to one of the Islamic hadiths that says, you know, I will say it first in Arabic and then translate it. And that means hospitality is for three days. And after that, it becomes charity. And, you know, we realize and recognize in the Arab culture that hospitality is a temporary practice. It's not a permanent one. And if it will go beyond three days, it becomes charity. So my question, my simple, very naive, nice question in arriving to Sweden, what will happen to me the fourth day if I would not accept to be a guest? What is my role? Do I become a neighbor? Do I have to practice my own public spaces? What, what a role might be and indeed I arrived to Sweden and for a while you know the first moment I arrived it was you know this white completely uh country that it felt absolutely far away from any landscape that I recognize and I was wondering can I even you know I don't know anything here can I even practice and then slowly slowly you realize that indeed temporariness is a big issue in Sweden. Hospitality is a big issue in Sweden. So in that sense, I began to question the role of the living room and, and especially the ones that we in architecture in somehow all of us has our grandparents and, and in my case, also my parents' living rooms. They are always decorated and nice and kept very ready for the host. And this, this was the plaza, the individual family plazas where a lot of self-representation was going on. You know, being a host means playing a role in society. So I began to question what does it mean actually not to be kept eternal guests forever, but still be insisting on the practice of hosting as, as, as a practice of visibility and as a practice of becoming member of society. And here maybe I will ask if we can see a film. It's a little bit uh, long, but we will end with the film and then having your uh, questions. The film is about how I reacted to, to uh, and this is only the first project I did. I will tell you a little bit after the film, other few projects that we did, but it was about do we have all to be included in one public spaces or people have the right to create as much public spaces as possible? And then, you know, to be just, we have to meet each other at the thresholds and nobody should include no one. And people should be still be able to move constantly between being guest and host and to understand democracy in society through the eyes of guest and host rather than uh, through other uh, other terms, and in in that sense, is there people that are kept 
hosts forever and therefore became a charity? Or, and is there people that actually can only imagine themselves as host, would never feel that they would become guests in any other places? And indeed, when they went as colonizers, they act as a host. They never accept themselves being guest followers. And in, in somehow, I think it analyzed this project of the living room, analyzed society from a point of view of guest and host. So if we can um, please uh, put on the, um, the, the video and then, and then we will uh, follow on later. The only story that is told about Boden is its military uh, story. The place that meant to protect the northern border of uh, Sweden from a potential war that would come from Russia. Wow, what a place. It was the place where soldiers used to live, waiting a war from Russia to arrive. The arrival of refugees in Boden is part of this war that they were waiting for. بتذكر أول ما طلعنا بالباصات وصلنا لهون عند بودن فأحد الأشخاص قالوا إنه السويد بعثتنا لعند الدببة ما في أشخاص هون نهائيا بس دببة فأنه أنا هيك تفكر يعني صفنت إنه معقول إنه هو بس غابات ودببة إنه كان رح يكون نص الغابات The yellow house is that building in the middle of nowhere in Boden and it used to be for a long time the most discriminated social housing for even the people in uh, Boden and that as a consequence it was termed to be uh, the place where refugees were uh, sent to live. You get inside these rooms, very small one, very closed one because of the winter, because of the cold and there is a feeling that they live completely alone in that place that where they belong nowhere and uh, they sort of have no social life and they seem to be waiting for that moment that they will leave that place. And, you know, I, I feel that the depression comes out of the fact that they had a dream of arriving to Sweden and by arriving to Boden, they were shocked that this was not the dream they were looking for. I was desperate. I thought that there is nothing that can be done there. I mean, from one side, a war that never arrived and from the other, refugees depressed and looking for the day they will leave Boden. What type of project can be ever done there? I wake up in the morning after and I decided to come back to the Yellow House and ask people if they know about anyone among refugees that is planning to stay in Boden. To my surprise, they told me, yeah, yeah, you should meet Yasmin and Brahim. <laughs> طب كيف ليش؟ 
علاقات هي من اول ما جينا حاول حاولنا نسوي هاي القهوه السوريه طب انا بدي اخذ لي كمان قهوه سوريه تصور يعني انه يحكوا هم انه الجود من من الماجود هذا مثل عربي فنحن هذا اللي 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 تعودنا عليه يعني في في بيئتنا وفي مجتمعنا وفي عاداتنا وتقاليدنا انه تحاول تقدم اللي عندك وبعدين ايش تعتبر انه هذا اللي انا اقدر اقدمه انا بدي ادفع هذول ما ليش اي الله وهات وهات كمان الله يسعدك احسب تنتين لا 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 ما خلص من لا هو ولا انت لا 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 وحياتك الهديه هيك صعبه ابراهيم احكي شيء نطلع مش دافعين تسلم شكرا وين somebody arrives to a new place He's obviously a guest. I have no problem to be a guest and I have no problem even to be a perfect guest, but I still want to exercise my right to host. And I think that what refugees lose the moment they cross the borders to Europe is their right to host. لما وصلنا لهون على السويد مثل ما خبرتك قبل كان كثير صعب انه تدخلي بالمجتمع السويدي وتتعرفي على اشخاص سويديين او انه مجرد انك تعرفيهم عن حالك وانه انتم انه احنا من سوريا فكان شعور انه حتى لما بقول لك اه سوري انه احنا اسفين انه هيك صار فيكم كان شعور ممكن انه يزعجنا يعني انه حتى لما واحد يتاسف على الشيء اللي صار شيء بيزعجك يعني ايه فمن هون انه بلشنا انه مثلا شفنا اي شخص انه تاع جرب اكلنا السوري فينا نحكي لك شوي عن سوريا فيك تعرف عنا شوي وهيك بلشنا من هالموضوع انه نفتح غرفة المعيشة تبعتنا او الليفينج روم مضافة بالنسبة لمجتمعنا العربي والسوري بشكل خاص وإذا فينا نقول محافظتنا نحن بشكل خاص الرقة آه، لها تاريخ قديم جدا أتذكر أول لما كان يحكي لنا أنه والدي مثلا أو أنه أجداده أنه كان باب غرفة المضافة ما بصير يتسكر أنه دائما بيكون مفتوح للضيف وكان الضيف يجي ثلاثة أيام على البيت وأنت ما تسأله حتى أنه ليش شو جاي يعني ثلاثة أيام بالضيفة وبعدها ممكن إذا بدك تسأله أنه أنت ليش جاي كان هذا المجتمع مثل مرجع يعتبر او مثل مكان يعني اوكي خلينا نروح لهذا المكان خلينا نروح لهي المضافه نروح تجي الناس طبعا اللي عندهم مشاكل يحكوا في مشاكلهم وبالاخص ايام الربيع العربي فصارت المضافه مكان التقاء الاراء كلها المؤيد مع المعارض كلهم يجتمعوا بنفس المكان ويصيروا يحكوا ويصيروا يتناقشوا ممكن توصل لحد انه انه هذا هذا الفريق مثلا فرحا بسقوط ديكتاتور بس اكلهم مؤيدين معارضين مو؟ بالضبط اي دونت ثينك اتس اتس ذا ويذر اور ذا كولد اور ذا ايزوليشن اي بليف ذات وات ريفيوجيز ميسز ذا موست از فاينلي سمبادي ويزاوت اكسبكتنج ات coming and knocking their door. أول حدا طلبنا منه إنه يجي لعدنا فقال إنه فتح التقويم تبعه الكالندر فعطانا موعد بعد أسبوعين أو ثلاث أسابيع ما بتذكر بالضبط فإنه أنا طلعت هيك عبراهيم إنه بعد ثلاث أسابيع لحتى يجي لحد لعنا وإنه يشرب فنجان قهوة فابراهيم قال خلص انه اوكي يعني نبلش من هيك فبكره كل اسبوع يصير عندنا حدا بقدر اقول انه هي نقلة نوعية كبيرة انه نحن نفتح غرفة معيشتنا براتا مهمة 
ابنك رح يعيش بهالمجتمع كيف انه انت رح تربي هالطفل بمجتمع جديد مثلا كل شيء فيه جديد يعني ما بقدر ربيه مثلا كيف انا ربيت بسوريا ولا اقدر ربيه مثلا كيف السويدين عم يتربوا هلا بس فيني اخذ مثلا من اثنين This living room managed to shift the whole dynamics of guests and hosts. Yasmin and Ibrahim are not anymore the guests in Sweden. They actually, by opening their living room, they managed to regain back their agency. Oi, oi. So they were so good. So what happened? دي دي يا الى بحر هند يبودا انتوا في الاوسط نونا ملتارنا سما لوين هاي بودا دو فيك انت اوكا هم سون 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 Only yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is integration only about denying a previous culture that you brought with you? Or it is about bringing the old and the new life together? And you know, at the sudden, in that tiny living room, I feel that Ibrahim and Yasmin was able to bring their past, their present and their future all together. Yeah. <laughs> I do. The living room project is very much about how to deal with the role of the domestic space within the framework of statelessness. Indeed, when I say statelessness, I don't mean that are only people that are without state legally, but statelessness means people that indeed feel not represented by the state or are not represented in that moment by the state or legally stateless. And in a sense, the, the way they disassociate themselves from the public space or that they do not belong to the public space or that they have hard time accessing public space, the role of the domestic becomes very important for them. And indeed, the Living Room Project is one of these projects that is very much dealing with if I am stateless, what does it mean for me to be still in collectivity, to create common places, to create places from where I still believe that I belong, I can speak, I can express my perspective, I can express my being, and I can be proud of who I am. During the process of the project, we were given a ground floor in the Yellow House. And in this ground floor, we tried to turn it into a semi-square. Indeed, the only architectural intervention that have been done here is to throw all possible walls and to open up to the uh, outside and is one of the corners of the uh, building becoming simply transparent and, and can open itself on both sides and in good days it becomes a completely open corridors to the outside and in the cold times it becomes a square through which you see the light and you see people sitting and it becomes almost a light box of square that people are able to see from outside and indeed interact or come in. And it has been working in an amazing way by having Yasmin proposing herself as a host. Yasmin began to come to the living room and began to activate it. Me. 
and with time they created what they called the Saturday's rituals. There is a lot of co-hosting or, or offering each other the ability of being hosts because they understand that hosting is power, hosting is visibility and they are all into this situation where they are kept guests forever as migrants and I think that they understood that by practicing the right of hosting it's a way of claiming agency of becoming visible in the city. هلا أنا يمكن أول وثاني مرة حسب ما بذكر أنا اللي اخترت وأنا تعمدت إنه تكون من بلدان مختلفة يعني كل أسبوع بلد مختلف يعني لكل واحد يظهر إيش في عنده مثلا وبنفس الوقت حتى لو كان مثلا من نفس البلد إنه أشخاص مختلفين كل واحد يظهر بيئته بشكل مختلف حتى فهي أول مرة وثاني مرة أنا اللي اخترت ممكن بس بعد هيك لا الأشخاص هم صاروا يجوا لعندي أو يكتبوا لي أو شيء إنه فينا إحنا نطبخ الأسبوع الجاي حابين نطبخ كذا حابين نكون يعني متواجدين بنشارك مثلا هم يعني هم بيحسوا انه هاد يوم هم يعني فبدهم يظهروا باحسن ما يكون بغض النظر ان كانوا متواجدين سويديين او مش سويديين الموجودين يعني بس انه كل شخص بيحس حاله انه خلص انه هاد يومي يعني ولا بعزم حدا بقول انه مين بده يطبخ المره الجايه وخلص فهو بيتكفل حتى باليوم بيخبر او هاي احيانا انه ايه اذا شفت حدا جديد او هاي بخبر عن المشروع انه نحن هناك فيكم تتفضلوا تواجدوا بس الاشخاص اللي متواجدين وبيعرفوا لا خلص حتى في بعضهم انه صار يوم السبت ما بيرتبط بولا شيء يعني في عندنا يل هاوس في عندنا وظافه لازم نروح ايه فهيك وحتى في رجال انه صارت تشجع المشروع مو بس نسائي يعني في رجال كثير صاروا يطلبوا انه هم يطبخوا انه هم يكونوا يشاركوا في رجال طبخوا يعني ايه فحسيت انه صار الكل يعني انه بده يطبخ بده يشارك بده يكون موجود يعني أو كمان مرتين ثلاثة خلينا كمان إنه فينا نقول مراهقين أو أطفال كمان يطبخوا طبعا بإشراف والدتهم يعني بس طبخوا واحد منهم بتذكر كان عمره يمكن 12 أو 13 سنة عمل لنا شاورما يعني فكان هيك حسيت إنه الكل يعني متشجع إنه أنا بدي يكون ليش لا أنا كمان فيني أعمل شيء فأنا يومها تفاجأت لما هو طلب مني إنه فيني أطبخ قلت له إيه ما في مشكلة فعد هو من اول وجديد يعني من من الصفر بلش وقطع الجاج واشتغل فيه من البدايه للنهايه وحسيت يعني قبل بيوم انه ستريس انه ثاني يوم ما بيلحق معلش افرم قبل بيوم الجاج وهي فهيك حسيتهم يعني انه بدهم يكونوا جزء and indeed i have to say that in three years time they absolutely managed to put the living room in the map, in the institutional map of the city. And, and, and you see them, they are proud of it. They even began to invite politicians at a certain point to bring them in their space and to show them what they managed to create. And there was a sense of proudness of being host and of having their own place where they can invite the rest of the city. جربتوا كثير مرات تعزموا السياسيين انتم تعزموهم للمضافة بدل ما هم يعزموكم لنشاطاتهم بتفكري اثر مين اللي عازم مين يعني اثر انه هم اجوا هون بدل ما انتم تكونوا رحتوا عندهم على البلديه ولا على مؤسساتهم ولا يعني اختلف شيء بطريقه بالعلاقه هو ما اختلف شيء بالعلاقه بس يمكن نحن اللي كسرنا الحاجز هلا اكيد واحد لما بيكون هو المستضيف فبحس نقطه القوه مثلا عنده بايده يعني ايه فلما انت مثلا بتقعدي انت تشرحي بصير دورك مثلا كلاجا انا بدي اشرح هلا انه هي قوانيني انه انا ببلدي مثلا كنت هيك انه احنا كنا ناكل هذا ايه هلا بجوز انه هو ما بيعني شيء للشخص المقابلك بس هو بيعني لك لك انه انت اعطيتيه شيء او نقطة أو شي نظرة عن الشي اللي عشتيه قبل يمكن هو بيعني لك كتير مثلا ممكن يعني لك كتير انه اشرب فنجان القهوة مع هيل يعني بجوز هو عم يتذوقه لأول مرة بجوز ما عجبه يعني بس بالنسبة لإلي يعني عم بشرح له انه فنجان القهوة مع الهيل بيعني لي كتير
Um, yes, I mean, um, in in somehow this was the first living room that that has been established in Sweden, but after that, in the Netherlands, at the entrance of a museum, and then in a, in a museum of architecture in Sweden, and in a refugee camp in Palestine, etc. We 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 had created more than one living room, and maybe I want to end by saying at the end of the day what this project is um, trying to uh, claim and push for is the is is it's the to understand the public space as a place hosted by the state so in somehow i think to think that the public space is for everyone can actually lead us that can be misleading because matter of fact the public space exists because the state is the host, because the state is the one cleaning it, taking care of it, being the host and hosting all of us. And in somehow, it's true that it's an abstract place and it feels that there is no host, but it's it's in somehow this is, a, a, I, I always say it's almost like God, right? It, it's, it's, it's there and it's observe you, but it doesn't. So it makes you feel as if it is open for everyone. But in that moment, if you don't know the codes of that space, and if you are, if your host is not familiar, it's not that you are welcome to that place. So I'm, I, I am only wondering, can we imagine a society with multi hosts? Can we imagine this? if if we are really into thinking a multicultural society, maybe what we need is a multicultural living rooms. We don't need one public space that include all cultures, but we need people's agency into creating their collectivities and spaces. And then, and of course, also the state can do that, but it's not the only one. There is no mono monopoly of one public space rather than as many living rooms. And the moment that, you know, you, you don't include me always in your living room because then I will become the perpetuated uh, guests and guests forever. But rather than, you know, I am hosting you when it's my living room and you host me in yours. And if we want to talk and discuss and negotiate something, we negotiate that thing in the threshold between these living rooms. This is for me, the real justice. This is where actually there is not one dominant culture that decides for everybody and everyone else is in this race of being integrated in that culture. But are we ready today to meet at the threshold? Are we ready today to imagine not only one monotheistic public space, but many of them where you know, their cultures are equally respected and being and having space and, and can still be meeting in, in neutral places. Because what I realize is that it is not true at all that public spaces in Europe and particularly in Sweden, where I am living right now, are simply neutral places. They are not. They demand that you get integrated into these places and they demand a certain way of performing and they demand you to be guests forever. And indeed, I will end by that. If they will, they want to come, they, they should behave. And they should behave means that they should be have as guests forever. And I think this is not how we will build a potential pluricultural uh, society. And I would end my culture here and uh, my lecture here. And, and thank you very much for uh, attending. Sandy. Okay. Sandy, thank you very much. Welcome. Ciao. Ciao. Uh, two words before giving the voice to the people in the room. Uh, it's, it's, I've been hosted by you several times, not only physically, but also uh, intellectually. And I think that all of us are in debt and so grateful because your thinking, your project, and your story is actually able to create a completely different stories and narrative that we are absolutely urgent to embrace 
to live with and to be provoked by. So thank you very much. And thank you for continuously pushing the discipline, the culture that we represent, and actually pushing ourselves as individual to, to imagine otherwise something that we are often forget to, to provoke. So thank you deeply from my experience and myself. There is a lot of things to, to do and to reflect upon, uh, but I would leave before saying something to, to anybody who wants to pose any questions or any reflection. We have a running mic, I think. I can't see you, Sandy, so... I see the people and I think you see the people. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm seeing the people. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And my question is uh, about the hospitality of refugee in Italy. And uh, I think we are not going forward. We are doing some step back. And for example, I'm from Ventimiglia in Liguria and um, uh, it's a city near to the France, uh, where all the refugees that want to go to the France uh, uh, stay there. And uh, we had a, a, an hospitality center for them. And um, three, about three years ago, with, the, with the, a new mayor, uh, decided to, to close this center. And um, it was a big problem because uh, people don't know where to stay. They they start living on the river, down the bridge, and uh, around the city. Um, so my question is, uh, how can um, th this kind of, uh, of, the, of of hospitality can be used in Italy? And uh, what is the the role of uh, of the architect in Italy to to help uh, this kind of uh, hospitality? Mm. Yeah, I mean, thank you for this uh, uh, question. I, I guess there are a bit two uh, answers to this. First of all, of course, the, the initial aid is extremely important. But then how we will distinguish between the very important fact that we have to aid, in, especially at, at the beginning of their arrival here, into understanding what happens the moment that... Um, we sort of speak about them becoming uh, members of, of that society. And, and the first aid, I, I would agree that, unfortunately, in all Europe, we are uh, dealing very, uh, very badly. And Europe is not one of these places that is re receiving as big number of refugees as the rest of the world. I mean, think about Turkey, think about Jordan, think about other places where, you know, Jordan almost doubled the blood, the, the the number of its citizens and and still be coping with it but i think that in europe we are when it comes to refugees unfortunately we are in front of a very ideological issue i mean a lot of political parties are winning or losing depending on their positions towards that and and these the refugees are becoming the others through which we are sort of protecting our public space and in that sense, I think what, you know, tell I, I will tell you what I felt my role as an architect, because it's I think it's extremely important that each one of us will find his own role, because otherwise we cannot have one role for everybody. It depends where you come from, what is your political position, how you deal with it. But I can tell you one very important story for uh, us. When when we went to Sicily to do our project, uh, the last one that was presented in Venice Biennale called the Entity of Decolonization, we were behind a building that is called Entity of Colonization, which is an entity that has been uh, built in Sicily as in the same way that it has been built in uh, in, in Libya. So Sicily, and this comes back to this whole rhetoric of Sicily needs to be modernized, 
needs to be civilized and therefore it needs colonization, right? So the same tools of colonization has been used in Sicily and has been used in Libya and in other places and, and actually same architects and same architecture. So what what the, the, these towns that were built in Sicily, eight, eight of them, each one has an enti- a building called entity of colonization. And that entity of colonization was to manage the colonization in, in that moment. So we went to Sicily, checked out all the towns and, and, and come to this uh, town called Carlentini and Borgurica. And we decided we would like to transform that building of the entity of colonization into an entity of decolonization. And we began to work with the municipality. But to come to your question, the question of refugees raised out and was just like, what we do? You know, we are in Sicily. We cannot, you know, and especially people like us, we were we worked with refugees for so many years. And, you know, I mean, our practice is based on temporariness. So what, what we do? How can we actually um, manage that issue? What, what is our role as architects? And we looked at ourselves and, you know, especially in, in that sense, me, and I say, you know, I am, I need today to use my power and privilege to break a frame because if I manage to be integrated, you know, I did this whole process of integration that I mentioned before. I speak Italian. I sort of, I'm managing today to elaborate a discussion around refugees. So, for them, it's important that they still be able to find their way out, a shelter that they would go down. We cannot simply put the problem, also the ideological problem on them and go the usual, you know, what, what a researcher would do would say, ah, let's go and hear what refugees would tell us to do. I mean, what is your needs? What do you think we should, where are the voices of these refugees? For me, this is not the right way because that means that you are putting all your problems on people that have already their own bloody problems that they need to deal with. And I think it's our urgency and role today to break that kinds of ideology, you know, to break that kinds of public space, to stop actually thinking of the public space in this way, to stop thinking of the private space in this way. And this is where you would create a different frame for refugees. So I thought if my, if I am today in Italy, my role would be actually to question all this in order for the people that will be ready to actually ch- challenge the frame would be w- with us would become more and more. But if we don't create that space, then we are always stuck on the initial part. And I think in that sense, thinking refugees and colonizations, thinking process of decolonization, pedagogy, learning, dictionary, words, and descriptions of spaces becomes crucial for them to have a different life later. But we cannot simply think we are giving them the microphone because what we are doing there is to include them in our frame. And they will always be, you know, even in their best performances, they would become me. So the people that became me and the people that want to challenge the frame like yourself, architects, we should we should challenge the frame of how do we deal today with public, because this is how we would support ourselves and indirectly support other people to challenge frames rather than, you know, simply going to Sicily where people are, you know, cannot even see us, cannot talk with us because because they have other urgencies. So I guess, you know, the ones that are holding the room, the ones that deals with knowledge production have the task today to reframe many concepts around that in order for people to be able to actually create their own frames. I think this is the real urgencies for us, uh, like refugees, uh, like architects. Otherwise, we would accept that we are giving charity. We are simply helping and 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 going after the fourth day and still be considering them guests and still be dealing with charity. I'm, I'm personally, I choose another road and I would like to think about it differently, but I think that we have to use our privilege and, and turn the table upside down. This is our task. It's not, our task is not to help uh, them today survive. I think that we can do way better. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much. It's it's really more 
to phrase a different question rather than to answering the same old question. And I think that is super important, both politically and epistemically. So thank you. There is anyone else? Maybe here. Hello, Sandy. Thank you for Hi. the presentation. I think it was really inspiring. Uh, my question is going to come from a bit more pessimistic place, I would say. So I want you to take it into account when you answer it, maybe. Uh, I'm Mustafa. My work is on Turkey-Syrian border. Uh, and so I had a chance to uh, interact with the asylum seekers and refugees who were living in the border region. And uh, taking from what you said about uh, the temporariness becoming more and more recurring, although as architects we are trying to think of permanent structures, I would like to say that uh, when I was working on the border region, I was thinking a lot about the future and how the people, the asylum seekers and the refugees, also the Turkish people who host the refugees, are thinking of the future and how they do perceive the concept of future or is there any future? And uh, we already talked a lot about this with Camilo. And, uh, but then when I was traveling in the region and talked with the people, um, obviously they were surprised what an architect is doing there in the region and asking some silly questions that maybe doesn't make sense at them, to them at that point. So it made me think, what, where is the architecture in it? As they asked to me, what am I doing there as an architect? And I wanted to ask you, the architecture practice, which built the concrete border walls in the region, how is it going to destruct the same border walls it, that it's built right now and it's been currently building? I mean, it's coming from a pessimistic place because still in Turkey, one third of the country is surrounded by the concrete border walls and they're still building it. They're still improving the system that they have. I mean, improving with the quotation mark. So I'm asking as architects, how are we going to destruct the walls that we've been building lately? Well, I mean, thank you for this uh, question. Again, I mean, I, I am I normally sort of try to a little bit um, answer from uh, from the practice because honestly, I mean, I don't have other answers than the one that I a bit experience and thought about and 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 maybe was taking by hand to understand. And in there, I would like to bring you in a Fawar refugee camp in, I wish I had time to show you this project because I think that it's at the center of the living room project. I mean, in uh, in 2000, between 2008 and 2014, I, I was in front of uh, thinking uh, a square in, in Fawar refugee camp, which is south of the West Bank. And, and this request came mainly from some mothers that, you know, their kids that are over 13, 14, especially boys are able to go outside and, and play while the both the girls, female girls and and younger uh, boys were had no place inside um, the, the the camp to um, to to play in and and we came immediately. I mean, as an architect, of course, I immediately thought they want a plaza. I mean, especially studying in or a square, uh, studying in uh, in um, in Italy, and we began to design a square. And at that point, you know, to my surprise, and it took me, I have to say years, sometimes I question like, how come it took me all these years to understand? So what people did in, in this tiny 700 meter square of, of you know, space in, in between the houses in the camp, that each one decided how high the wall of that square should be. And I was just like, it was the moment where, where the wall between Palestine and, or Israelis was building this horrible wall. And I was just like, you know, as an architect, I cannot build wall. Sorry, I mean, a square should be completely open. This is the definition of a square. This is who we are. This is, you know, we have to be open. People have to happen by chance in this plaza. How, how, how do you want me to build these walls? And in that sense, actually, they were so patient with me, but highly patient. 
to make me understand and to understand maybe themselves because you know they had to deal with the space themselves it was a self-managed space there was no state that would manage it so anything that would happen in this space would be processed from within the community so conflict uh, good things, bad things, management, how, how if a wedding will take place, a funeral, kids playing, uh, somebody that that got hit in this place, what, what happens? Because, you know, even courts in, in refugee camps are processed internally. I mean, things are really processed fully internally. So they, they there is a whole self-management. And they explained to me that wars are extremely important because they create threshold. And I'm not now saying that walls are good at, at all, but I learned as an architect to actually distinguish between walls. Walls that, that gives me, I mean, in, in that sense, they explained to me that what they needed is a roofless living room rather than a square the way we understand it in Europe that is managed by the state. And, and they wanted a living room because they know how to manage it. Because the moment that you cross the threshold, you understand that in this moment, if people have a wedding, they are the one hosting you. It's clear who is hosting whom. And in that sense, I think our role, if you are asking me what is our role as, as, as architects, is to stop thinking that architecture is only material and that we have a huge knowledge, political, and social knowledge that we can apply to understand why in this case, a wall is different than that other wall. I see this happening so rarely in architecture. You know, why a wall that create an open roofless living room and if a war refugee camp create a sort of a sense of settlement for people, a sense of knowing how they can deal with the place, a sense of justice that, that they can deal with it and self-manage themselves. The moment that you cross the door, they wanted four walls and three doors. This was the square that they insisted on. And in my head as an architect, because I thought walls are bad, I was unable to hear them. You know, they were so patient with me for years. It took me seven years, seven bloody years to accept that, you know, in a stateless situation, a walled square is the only way to have a square, right? So I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I am answering your question, but what I am trying to say is that I understood that our role is actually to question who is to whom we are building, who is the host, who is the guest, what are the community we are dealing with, and not only, you know, this rhetoric of community participation, so you just go and put the microphone in, in front of someone. I mean, what, what was required from my side, and I have to admit that it took me a while, is to actually unlearn and learn a lot of knowledge that they taught me in faculties of architecture and learn in order to able to learn. And I think this is, we have to be humble enough to unlearn, especially in architecture. And for us that we were taught by modern architecture, we have so much to unlearn. So I would say that our task is to a little bit humble our, uh, our our practice and learn that there is a lot to unlearn before thinking that we can civilize the rest of the world around us and bring them modern architecture so they would become part of the new world and this underdeveloped people will will actually become this is this is the model we are proposing so I think there is a huge task for architects to uh, sort of embark in but I would say it will begin from the unlearning. Thank you, Sandy. Absolutely mammothian task, but super urgent. Um, anyone else? Yep. You tell me when we need to stop, huh? Yeah, sure. You decide the room. <laughs> I'm happy to stay with you. Okay. okay. Um, thank you for a very thought-provoking lecture. Uh, my question is about uh, your project in Sweden. Uh, did you face any challenges or resistance while merging, merging different communities, uh, considering their different cultural backgrounds, and especially when the power dynamics switch in that situation? 
And uh, did locals need convincing of the importance of them becoming a guest in this situation? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you for this question. I think it also it's it's extremely important to explain that you know as 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 an architect and artist in this this was a commission from the Swedish government. So in somehow in Sweden there is something called public art agency, which is a, a Swedish uh state run public art government that commissioned me at that moment to go in Budin and work around this whole uh, thing of the um, of the yellow house and you know their idea was that I will be doing maybe most probably you know public art has a very specific sort of maybe a, a something that would represent or would uh, remind people of the refugee issues because at, at a certain point, Bodin become a very important gate to um, Sweden. And instead of doing so, I, indeed, you know, they were asking me what, how I will be acting. And instead of doing so, I decided I would like to create a, a living room. And, and it was also, it was nice because it's it, it took a bit of a time. So, and somehow it began at the living room first of Yasmin and, and Brahim. And it began there very strongly because in, in somehow, you know, when I entered with them, I was accompanied by two members of the Swedish government of the Swedish state. So in my mind, I was accompanied by that state. And the moment I entered to their house and see these two young people hosting the Swedish state, I thought this is what I have to work on, right? I mean, it, it felt so strong, this whole reversing of that dynamics. But of course, you know, in the way to begin with, we began absolutely to have them hosting and slowly, slowly, they began to invite politicians. But maybe in a sense, some of the people that were a little bit open locally came for the food at the beginning because you know Budin is a city that has so little it's not it's not Stockholm it's not a center it has only a Japanese restaurant and that's it so in some way for them to eat and this is where the power of food becomes very important for some people that are are curious and and they were offering food so and somehow people were coming enthusiastic first about this idea of and maybe they have to bypass a little bit of fear so maybe lovers of food bypass a little bit of fear by by this place of refugees because of you know some food curiosity so it it began a little bit like this and the moment they be, began to sometimes come and but if you notice actually the project was closed without explanation by the migration office so and it's 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 quite incredible this this story of this project in sweden because it was commissioned by the government Three years after, actually, it was acquired by Moderna Mosaic, which is by Moderna Museum, which is the most important museum in Sweden. And it is part now of the Swedish heritage. It is part of their collective permanent collection. And while Moderna was acquiring the project, the migration office was closing it. So I don't think that it's easy to say you know, how, how do we deal? What was the reaction? Each one, even the government itself was reacting to this in a complete different manner. And, and unfortunately, I did not have the chance to uh, sort of understand the reason of taking away the, the, the house because it, actually they did not have any, any uh, burden on like financial burden. But I guess, you know, they left me to interpretation. And for me, they were completely uncomfortable with themselves and learn a little bit how not to be um, paternalistic, you know, how not to be, uh, you know, they were there as saviors of these poor refugees that need them. And at a sudden, they saw them building their own sort of square their own sort of being they were inviting politicians they were insisting on their power of being part of the city on their own terms and i think few of them had a little bit of hard time to unlearn or shift their own positions and for me this is the reason i the only interpretation i have this is the reason of why this project was was closed so i guess there is no one perspective it's such complex 
a project that within the government itself, they don't have similar uh, positions and, and the same with the local community. And the same with refugees, I have to say. So it's hard to say where, uh, uh, but 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 matter of fact, I can tell you that it's not only people from Boden, but all over the north of Sweden, especially the ones that would arrive, they would know that Saturdays, if they will go to the living room there, they will begin already to meet many people. So it really began to work as a center beyond church and mosques, which was very important because it was a civic place that was hosted every week by someone else in the community. And this whole rotation of hosting was extremely important because it was rotated by different kinds of cultures, different kinds of refugees, different kinds of languages, different kinds of food. So there was each each week someone would choose to be a host. So I think the project was built around this whole idea of in, inter uh, in, in, inter exchange between guest and host constantly. Andy, thank you very much. Uh, I think we are a little short on time, um, but I think you've been given a very fantastic uh, um, uh, reflection across different axes of your work. I, I, I think I have something like 120 questions, but I'm, I'm keep them to, to Copenhagen in a few weeks where we met. I think uh, we're going to have a little yeah. bit of time. So, Sandy, thank you very much. I, If I can take one minute, because I think it's super important, the not only the legacy of your work, but the mission that you are asking us intellectually, which is actually dismantling this fundamental project of integration around which all of us is built upon which is asking permission to monopoly, to universalism, to exclusion. And I think your narrative and the project you've done are actually not only continuously expanding the thresholds, just to use your word, of uh, architecture, but actually looking beyond, uh, behind, uh, and through what we are often thinking uh, of it as a practice, as a subject. So thank you really very much for the work and thank you for the time you spent with us. I'm sure there will be following conversation and um, grazie mille. Grazie a voi. Ciao, ci vediamo Ciao. presto. A presto, see you a Copenhagen. Va ah, bene, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Grazie mille per la lecture. Grazie.